Have you ever enjoyed doing something like journaling and found that you stopped doing it? Or even better, have you ever gone to a restaurant, like your favorite restaurant, and then find out six months later you don't go anymore? Journaling and eating at your favorite restaurant probably don't have a lot to do with each other, but not doing something you enjoy does, right? I believe the toughest part of journaling is keeping up with your practice. And once you've stopped, it'll take a lot of effort to reboot your practice. I'm calling journaling a practice now because it's like any other fitness or any other wellness program. It takes effort and it takes skill. Hi, I'm Scott. I help people use journaling to improve their focus and their productivity and their mindfulness. I believe that the best way to improve yourself is to be proactive, be intentional, and to write in your journal about your experiences. Today, we're going to discuss why people stop journaling and the problem with stopping, and then three tips to reboot your journaling practice. First things first, I have a lot of experience with stopping things that are really good. And I also have a lot of experience with rebooting things and getting things going and understanding the effort it takes to get stuff going. I asked my daughter about this and she reminded me that it's okay to take breaks as long as you get going again. The wisdom of a 17 year old is amazing. She just floored me when she said that. It's okay to take breaks, dad, as long as you can keep it going again. Anyway, I felt much better about it and here I am. All right, let's get to it. Here are a few reasons why we stop journaling. The first one that I wanna talk about is competing demands. What are competing demands? Well, we all have a limited amount of time and we have many things to do. So when we experience this tug of war of choosing what to do and what not to do, oftentimes we'll deprioritize our self-care activities, working out, eating right, journaling, meditating. These are the things that go the quickest because of competing demands. We're all busy. Second is a problem with perfectionism. Oftentimes when we're journaling, we look back at our work and we say, how terrible is that? I hate my handwriting. Look at my grammar. My stream of consciousness is not long enough. It's too long. It's too wordy. It's not concise enough. And we pick ourselves apart and our internal editor will chew away at our desire to journal and eventually we'll just walk away. And the third reason people stop journaling is that they get into a rut. They find that they write the same thing over and over and over. And it just becomes sort of like a a bore to just write the same thing over and over and over. Before we get onto the problems with stopping journaling, I would like to invite you to connect with me. You can subscribe to this channel. We have social media. There's links down in the description of this video. Uh, there's a email newsletter that I send out every week. The value of connecting is that you don't have to be alone in your journaling journey. There's a community out there and we're ready to support you and help you. Well, let's talk about the problem with stopping journaling. Once you stop a good thing, it's difficult to get it started. And the reason why is because good intentions don't work. What's the saying about good intentions? Grandma had one, it was like, the path somewhere was paved with good intentions. Put it down in the comments. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what that saying is. Anyway, you may have experienced this when you stop journaling, is that your muscles for journaling become weaker and weaker. And you always tell yourself, I'll get back to it one day, or I'll get back to it when I feel like it. Or I've heard other people come up with a plan to journaling, all of based on good intentions, such as, when I feel like journaling, I'll journal. Many self-care practices are like this. You become desensitized to the triggers that make you wanna take care of yourself. And eventually, you're not phased by it at all and you just ignore those triggers. So what are some things that we can do to reboot your journaling practice? The first I wanna talk about is time chunking. Time chunking is when you break up your day into manageable sized chunks. Let's say you have three chunks per day, morning, afternoon, and evening. You could dedicate your morning to self-care, your day to work, and your evening to recovery. These are really broad chunks. But if you dedicate time to doing something for yourself like journaling or working out or brushing your teeth may be enough to trigger you into journaling. Or maybe it's the end of your day during your recovery time when you're taking care of yourself. The value of time chunking is that you're prioritizing self-care every single day. 
you know that in the evening, it's your time to do some self-care or in the morning when you wake up, it's time to, to participate in your self-care activities. The problem with these is that they still may depend on good intentions, what we just talked about. One way to move past just remembering that the end of your day is a recovery time, a time for self-care, is that you could set a calendar reminder to give you an alert on your watch or on your phone so that you see every single day, oh, it's 10.30 p.m., I should be winding down. I should, you know, take some time to set aside for journaling. So how do we get around this problem with good intentions? Pulling yourself up by the bootstraps isn't always possible, especially if you're dealing with some seasonal affective disorder or, you know, it's a little bit of light depression. Pulling yourself out up by your own bootstraps is nearly impossible. I do want to take a moment that if you are in a crisis, I'm a big fan of counseling. A crisis would be a time or an event in your life where your normal coping mechanisms are not working and you've lost sight of, of the future. Um, I would highly recommend that you get in touch with a professional, talk it out, work those, work those feelings out. Journaling can be a great tool for that, but nothing replaces a good professional counselor to talk with. Another way to avoid depending on your good intentions for journaling is to create rules to live by. We all have rules to live by. Actually, we have hundreds of them. Things like Look both ways before you cross the street. No swimming 30 minutes after you've eaten. Don't drink alcohol after 5 p.m. The last college football game I was at, we were out tailgating, and I swear that I heard at least five different people say, it must be 5 p.m. somewhere, as they drank at nine in the morning. I'm quite certain that they were feeling it by noon. By three o'clock, they were done. And that is probably why you shouldn't drink alcohol past 5 p.m. Another good reason why rules to live by work if you play games like Euchre or like chess, there's all sorts of rules to live by, like turn down a bow or lose for an hour. In chess, don't bring out your queen early. Castle as soon as you can. These are things that just, you know work and they don't rely on good intentions. They just become, they just become automatic. Another rule to live by is brushing your teeth at night. About 20 years ago, I was an eager software development team leader. I was on the manufacturing floor connecting with one of the older electricians. He was the sort of guy who had gnarly fingers from twisting and soldering wires together for 30 years. And I began to ask him the normal questions about his job. Then I asked him what was important to him. He paused for a little bit and then turned to me and said, I wanna tell you something about me. I've brushed my teeth every night for 43 years, except one time. And then he said, let that sink in a little bit, one time. And then after he paused, he said, that's something that's important to me. I had a really hard time keeping my jaw from dropping. 43 years except one time. How do I make that into a software requirement? What do I do with it? I was in an existential crisis, to be honest with you. I'm not sure what to do with that even now, today. All I know is there was a rule to live by and he relived by it for 43 straight years, except for one time. Now that I recall this story from 20 years ago, I need to tell something to you that's important to me, is that I've brushed my teeth at night for 20 years, and I haven't missed a day. <laughs> Just joking, I miss all the time. But every time I brush my teeth at night, I think of this old gnarly guy who brushed his teeth for 43 years except one time, and it was important to him. To say the least, I probably did not change his life, but he changed my life with that story. The cool thing about rules to live by is that our brain uses them. Our brain depends on them, really. We have this ability to block out all the stuff that's going on around us with deletion and generalization and distortion. Deletion is the ability to kind of not see a lot of the stuff around us or we'll get too overwhelmed with it. Distortion is not really the best where we start telling ourselves stories. And generalization are typically rules to live by. We generalize things so that we don't have to think about the complex reasons why things are true and not true. We just generalize them and they become a rule to live by. It's a very strong motivation in our lives. And if you create a rule to live by that you should journal, 
then it will sink in that way. So why don't we make a rule to live by together? We will journal at least one gratitude statement before we scroll on social media. And the last tip for rebooting your journaling is to create a visual trigger. I talk about this one a little bit in my gratitude journaling video that I'll post at the end of this video uh, for you to catch up with. Essentially, we are creatures of habit and we run the same routines over and over and over, day after day. Occasionally those routines are updated, like, like going to a different restaurant, like we talked about at the beginning of this video. Other times, routines like our bedtime routine may not ever change for years and years and years. A visual trigger is sort of grokking that idea that if you were to put something like a journal at a place where you would see it, then it will remind you, it will trigger you to journal. So let's say you're gonna journal in the morning and you drink coffee every morning. You wake up, you make a beeline to the coffee maker, you do your business there, and while the coffee's brewing, you've got a few minutes to journal. If you put your journal right next to the coffee maker or where you wait for the coffee to be made, then you're golden. You've got a chance to write a couple of gratitude statements that will ultimately spin your day into a better trajectory. Another example is setting your journal with on your nightstand, next to your bed, next to your pillow. So when you're going to bed, you see your journal, you're reminded that you should write down a few things about what happened that day. The problem with doing it in the evening, visual journal in the evening is that you're tired and you're probably worn out by the time you wanna to go to bed. And chances are you may be de desensitized on that one, uh, but it's worth a try. All right, well, thank you for hanging in there with me. A quick recap of our discussion is that writing in a journal is like a wrestling match with the world. We have competing demands, tug of war with the world. We have perfectionism, we have our own internal editor, and we have getting in a rut and finding that we're writing the same things over and over and over. Remember that the problem with stopping is that good intentions to get going again just don't work. And three tips to changing it up are time boxing, rules to live by, and visual triggers. All right. Thanks again. I'll post at the end of this video, the gratitude journaling video that has the visual triggers ideas in it. I want to thank you again and we'll see you next time.